Hi, I'm Joanna Barron. And I'm Leslie Gray. Welcome to the Love and Dividends podcast, where women get smart about money. We'll share interviews and conversations about optimizing your finances, getting started with investing, and building that sweet wealth. In today's episode, we're chatting with Jen Shell. Jen is an investment advisor at Tree Grove Capital, and we'll be chatting about how to look at recent stock market dips, creating a plan to get through the pandemic, why capitalism can be an expression of creativity, and working as a woman in finance. Um, okay, so welcome, Jen Shell. Jen is a partner, portfolio strategist, and portfolio manager, associate portfolio manager at Tree Grove Investment Management. Um, she provides expert decisions from a broad spectrum of investment strategies, and she previously was an investment advisor at big investment advisories like CIBC Wood Gundy, Emo, Nesbitt Burns. Jen and I ran into each other at an event last spring and just had so many common interests, so many common, um, so many common concerns about the generally she and grow heavy world that investment advising can sometimes be and a shared desire to just talk about money and finances and investing in a way um, that is accessible. So welcome, Jen, how are you doing? Thank you. Jen, we're so glad you're here. Thanks, Thanks. I'm glad to be here too. It's a nice break from the madness. Yeah, so are you fully uh, working remotely, fully social isolating and hunkered down at home? Uh, Yes, which I'm glad I am because I function completely digitally. So I can do everything from my computer and have access to the financial institution that we deal with on the back end. So I'm good from my end. Wow, you were COVID ready. I was. I was a doomsday <laughs> the prepper. The original, yeah. <laughs> I think we're all now learning how to function remotely. It's the slow go. I would say for Joe and my profession, as lawyers aren't always used to used to this, we don't always embrace technology as quickly. No, definitely uh, not. And how, how about you, Les? Or how are you uh, adjusting? Because you only started a new job like a couple of months ago. I did. I am. It's thank goodness it's going really well. Um, but I'm definitely uh, in all the memes that are like, check in on your extrovert friends. Like, that's about me. <laughs> like, I'm definitely like <laughs> at the window being like, what's everyone doing? What's going on? Where are people? <laughs> so it's been a good, it's been a good like personal growth <laughs> challenge. <laughs> I'll put it that way. But overall, yeah. can't complain. Yeah, see, I'm an introvert, so I'm kind of vibing right now. I mean, obviously, I would prefer to not have the portending sense of doom. And, you know, the sort of constant flow of terrifying news. Yeah. But I yeah, kind of too. feel like I'm on an extended yoga retreat at home. <laughs> Sometimes literally, because I've been doing a lot of like Zoom yoga, teaching it and taking it. Um, but also I just, uh, it feels really natural to me to be sequestered. So I will take note to check in on my extra friends. I have no idea what that feels like. But I think <laughs> if there was ever a litmus test of if you're an introvert or an extrovert, it's, yeah. it's right now. If you're like, oh, no problem, <laughs> just stay home, you know, only communicate, only have physical contact with people that you are 100% plugged into and locked into. That is like kind of my modus operandi. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was defined by an HR specialist as an extroverted introvert, whatever mm. that means. So Me. I do need my social time, but I recharge when I'm alone. So, so far, so good. I'm recharging, but we'll see how long that lasts before I... Cool. Well, and That's I think crazy. outside of that, to your point, Joe, my one of the biggest stresses, I'm sure for me and others is finances and is the crazy things the markets are doing. So that's part of why I'm so excited to have just Jen here as an expert. Can you start to dive into like your take on all of this? I know that's a broad yeah, and question. also, yeah, are people and, like, what should we be is... doing? Like, what am yeah. I supposed to do at home? Yeah. I just stay put? Yeah. Do What do I do? Yeah, I think financially. Everybody... But yeah, everybody's afraid and always has been afraid of the unknown. I tend to thrive in chaos. So I'm in my element here. Um, You know, I make big decisions every time there is a big uh, recession. So like in 2008, I totally changed career paths. And then around 2011, when we had another bit of a dip, I also changed career paths. So uh, for me, this is fine. But people, there are two schools of thought. Some people are taking, looking at this as the biggest opportunity ever. 
Mm. And others are afraid and are panicking and just want to sell everything and basically hunker down in their bunker (laughs) and uh, stock up on canned goods and toilet paper. Yes. And so, but as, as an investment advisor, like, what are you telling people? Because yes, yeah. everything that I've, I've had both those is, thoughts. Yeah, this is, this is a, I, so I hear two things from sort of credible, intelligent um, investment specialists. One is this is a fire sale. Like this is the best mm-hmm. time to get started with investing, put your money in the market. Most of these companies, that stocks are down, um, even though nobody's calling the bottom yet. They're going to be okay. They're going to, and in a year or two, we're going to say this was a great investment opportunity. And then other people say cash is right now. So stop, hold off on putting money into your index funds, into your stocks, just like, you know, uh, stock up on cash because nobody knows what's going to happen. And if you're liquid, you'll be in a much better position. So what's your view on that? Oh. Well, in my experience, people are fine with buying, but they don't know when to sell. And then they don't, once they've sold, they don't know when to get back in. So okay. It all depends on the individual. What I would say is open up your statement because a lot of people just ignore this stuff. Mm. They don't care about their investments they or they just rely on whoever's managing them to get them ahead. So I would open up whatever statements you have, maybe anything you have from this year and take a look at what you have and try to understand it. And if you don't understand it, then find somebody to give you another opinion on what you do have. Because a lot of people will be well positioned, they could ride this out and they'll be just fine if their objectives are long term and they're saving for retirement. But if your you know, if your money is not managed properly, then it's a good time to do some spring cleaning and get rid of what's not working for you and to position yourself for future gains ahead of time when we come out of this. Because anything can happen. Like I don't have a crystal ball and I don't think anybody else does either. So if somebody comes up with a vaccine or else drugs that, you know, kind of help the symptoms and make it less dangerous, then we're going to see a rally in the market. Um, it all depends. Like, I don't know how long it's going to take to flatten this curve. And we, we've had some big days recently where, you know, the market's been up like 8, 10% in one day. And we never know which days those are and what's going to stimulate the market to that effect. So the best thing to do is just to have a plan that works well for your objectives. If you're a senior citizen or you're somebody who needs X amount of money to live off for the year, make sure you have that amount in cash. So come up with a, you know, your expenses and figure out how much you need month to month to live. And that portion, I would say, yes, should be in something more conservative so you can liquidate if you need to. Uh, So those are my thoughts. Like I would say six months. Jen, can we go back though to the looking at it because I have to say for my and I'm not an expert on this I used to look at my investments every day I was very comfortable with the little like oop, it's up today it's down tomorrow I, I only use index funds and ETFs and re- this is the first time I've just had to stop looking at it because the it, you know it went so low a couple weeks ago that I was like I just I, I can't get my head around this and I don't I know the only thing I sort of know is okay don't sell because I'd be selling at such a low but I almost Mm -hmm. am I'm having issues I don't know can you (laughs) I don't know can you yeah so your advice advice? modify because I'm like so scared to look at things yeah for so for the average person uh (laughs) you know that is listening to this who's let's say a young professional that is just getting started with uh index funds ETFs um, yes. Would the general advice be to just ride it out because probably the standard and four is 500. Those are pretty good bets to bounce back. Or what things should we be looking at when we look at our state? Yeah. What should we look Besides, at? Besides, so like take a huge shot of whiskey. Before yeah, because yeah. <laughs> it's scary. It's like I'm I'm not one who shied away. And, and I would have agreed with that so much to anyone getting started with money. And suddenly I'm like, oh, if looking at this just stresses me out because it makes me tempted to be like, get out now. But I, I know that's wrong. But intuitively, I sort of have that feeling of like, take it all in cash. Well, it depends. If it's, it's like I said, it's not a loss until you sell it. So it really depends what you have. And I can't comment without looking at a statement to see whether it's in your best interest to sell or not. But can't, sorry, but isn't Um, it safe to say right now, are we in the biggest crash in history? Isn't it safe to say anyone in the, who's in an ETF has seen a huge loss in the last couple of weeks? Like, I, I, I totally hear what you're saying in terms of like each, each person's different, but just that's why if we just look at the S and P 500, all of us would have taken a huge hit this month, right? Isn't that? Uh, yes. Can we give would. that generally? 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just like I think I, th I usually would totally agree and be like, no, no, don't give any financial advice. Each person is different. But I think right now it's one of the few times in history we can all be in the same boat being like, yeah. so we all just, we all just took a huge hit. And, and regardless of some people, maybe, I guess if they predicted this, but I think most people are, are for the first time seeing big losses, at least our generation, at least millennials, yeah. maybe weren't investing in 2008. I think this is the first time we've actually opened statements. As mm -hmm. I say, that's not just a couple hundred down, but we're like, wow, a substantial portion of my portfolio appears to be lost. And I love your point of nothing's lost till you sell it. But I wonder yeah. if you could just talk us through some of that, because I actually think it's the first time we can talk about finances, not just, well, it depends what you're doing, but almost mm -hmm. as a collective being like, okay, we're all in the middle of like quite a hit. Yeah. So I tend to buy when things are down. Uh, maybe I'm a okay. contract. So you're the, it, you're the fire sale. Yeah. I'd rather, if it's, if I look at, I look at financials, I go into the, you know, the balance sheets and check out all the accounting statements and what management's doing to position themselves for the future. And so I plan ahead and then I look and see if the valuation's okay for me. But if you're in ETFs, like the general market, um, like, yeah. like that's what I said, it depends on your objective. If you need the money within the next year, you're going to have to look at it seriously and see if you need to sell something to pay your bills. So mm -hmm. this year, if, if you need to pay your bills, you're going to have to get somebody to look at it either yourself or, I mean, you can send your statements to me and it's all confidential, but, um, and I can kind of look at it, but for the, if you need money right now, you're going to have to look at it and make yourself a plan. Um, mm. if you don't need it for the next year, then just sit and wait. And if you're in, yeah, if you're in the, you know, the big indexes and or indices and you have high quality ETFs or high quality investments, you'll probably be fine. Like if, especially if your objectives are long term, like you just have to be sensible and wait because there are a lot of people who are taking this opportunity to make a lot of money off of you. And we haven't Ooh. seen that drop. Who are those people? Care. Every, you know, traders, people who are very knowledgeable about the market. Okay. Um, if people had cash on hand, like real estate prices are crazy right now. So let's say you, so you're like, all right, I'm going to sell my property. I just made, you know, $500,000 on the market and I can put it to work right now. There's some people on the sidelines who are just waiting to get a good deal. We haven't had this pullback in five years. So there are some people who are taking the opportunity. They know it'll probably go up. You have so much, we have a big population. We need the resources. We need the goods and services to provide for all these people. And the middle classes are, um, you know, they're getting better and they're increasing in their wealth. So we're going to need an increase in services down the road. So we're not going to stay here forever. We're not going to be this long mm. unless we get, you know, like in this virus, a lot of people are getting over it. It is temporary. It's going to work itself through the system right now for the next few weeks. It's going to be insane. It's going to be volatile. It's going to be crazy. Uh, but, you know, maybe you are just best to wait it out and see over the next three weeks how things pan out. But like I said, if you need the liquidity and you need the cash now, that's when you really have to start looking at what can I sell to get the money that I need or what resources are out there um, to maybe get a loan because interest rates are very, very, very low right now. So that mm. might be the best option for you instead of worrying about your investments that you should have a plan in place. So if your plan is for the long term, for 20, 30 years down the road, then I wouldn't worry about it because, you know, over the long term, it does come back and it increases and your dividends pay out over time. So it's just like time in the market is essential. Yeah, I love You're that. You're saving me so much. Yeah, good. I, I like that's so what we needed. Sure. Yeah, that's what yes. we want. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm so happy maybe, with everything you're saying. Yeah. So, so for, the, for those of us that had a plan, like, you know, would you almost be like, hey, with the money and and it's a really privileged position not to be in. So I take your point. There'll be a lot of people who need money mm -hmm. who, who are going to figure out how to get access. For those who feel stable, would would you say it's a good time to invest? Like, can our can us and our listeners be on that train of people who come out of this better? Or is that too risky of an approach, do you think? Yeah. And that's where it depends on your risk tolerance. If it were me and yeah, I have cash on the sides, I, we're down. I would just put the money to work. But um, yeah. That's that's me, right? I'm high risk, <laughs> and I'm fully <laughs> invested at all times because I can't I can't take advantage of these opportunities in the market, even though I see them, like for shorting or things like that. I'm invested okay. with my clients. I'm in the same thing as my clients are, so I just made sure that you know it kind of looked a little 
toppy in the market. So I made sure that I bought quality because we do, we invest according to your objectives that you have in the plan that we have in place. So I just make sure not to buy any junk and just to buy high quality investments. I know are going to be around in the next five years. Like what would be an example of junk? Uh, some obsolete industries. Um, okay. You know, like I won't name it. Some, you know, retail stores are a lot of them are going out of stock. Yeah. So anything that's kind of a traditional model or obsolete management, <laughs> if you see they're not really progressing, <laughs> they're kind of dangerous places yeah. to be. And those are what you call value traps. So, you know, oh, it's worked in the past 20, 30 years. And I know a lot of investment professionals work that way. I've had this for 30 years. It's always going to work. But you have to look at what times are like now. And sometimes that won't work for you. So like I said, do some spring cleaning of your portfolio. If you need cash, call your advisor, whoever it is that you trust to figure out a plan for you and have a plan. If you don't have a plan, put one in place right now. One for one year, one for five years, one for 15 years. And if you don't need cash, if you're moving along, there yeah. might be a nice opportunity here. There's opportunities every day, every day. I, Ooh. in one of my old podcasts or I have, I tell you, there's an opportunity every single day. So don't have that FOMO approach to things like, oh, I just missed out on this. It won't come back. There are a lot of opportunities. Oh, I'm feeling better. And, 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 and how would a lay investor, like what are the things to look for to start to spot those opportunities? Like, for example, I know that there are obvious businesses and business models that, as you say, are the opposite of junk right now that are starting mm -hmm. to look indispensable like food delivery boxes and video conferencing services and things like yeah. that should is it does it make sense to actually look at what's going on around us and sort of look at the companies that are really adaptive to that yeah it depends how much money you have to invest because you got to keep in mind there are transaction fees and you want to be diversified if you want to take the safe logical approach of getting your six to eight percent return every year so if you're not really familiar with the stock market and how it works in companies, I would stick to something that's more diversified, like invest in, you know, you can go to the branch or wherever, but you can invest in mutual funds or ETFs. And at least you have a bunch of names in there and you can participate that way and you won't lose your shirt. Whereas if you pick one stock or just three stocks or whatnot of companies that you know, um, one or all of them may not. And yeah, I mean, if you want to look at a test to see, you know, there's a lot of names that are familiar with you. You can look around your household and you can see um, your favorite products that you like to use. <laughs> you can take a look and do some researching on some of those names. And you can see there a lot of times they're made by a big corporation. Uh, so you can check out which companies hold your favorite products and just like you have name recognition. So you can look at investment opportunities like that. Um, I wouldn't take anybody's stock tip advice if they're not an investment professional. Um, and I'm coming out with something shortly, but not yet. And I'm about to, I'll probably launch in a couple months to give people more guidance on how they can invest. But right now your options are, you can get advice from a professional that's already out there, um, or you can do it yourself, but then you have to do your own research and look at financial sites and stuff and such for that. Or you can listen to our podcasts. Yay. Yeah. Well, definitely let us know when your course or product launches. It will definitely be of interest to us as well as to our listeners. Um, so let's just pivot for a minute. I just want to talk about just because you have had a kind of varied and diverse career in terms of being with the big banks and now pivoting to kind of be able to do your own thing and have a bit more independence. Yeah. And I just wondered... What's your insight into how the investment advisory world works? Um, if you liked about it, and you'd be totally general, because obviously you don't want you, uh, you know, smack talking your former employers. But how how did you perceive it, and particularly how did you perceive it as a profession for women? Yeah, yeah we'd the, love some inside scoop. Yeah, I've worked at different parts of the financial institutions. I mean, I've worked in insurance and underwriting. I've worked in commercial banking. I've worked on the front lines as a customer service representative, and I've worked as an investment advisor. Um, there are some good and there are some bad parts. So I'm going to give you both because I think that's helpful. Yeah. Um, 
the nice thing, the good part, I really appreciated the structure of the banking system and how it works and how everything works together. And I learned a lot through that. And my standards are pretty high when it comes to knowing what works and what doesn't. So in terms of software that they use and how to get things functioning and how to have all the working parts work together. Uh, so I appreciate that. And that experience was fantastic. I've had some excellent managers. I've had some not so great managers. The ones at the big financial institutions were better um, than the smaller ones for sure. Uh, except for now, now we, we're in a partnership. So I, I think my colleagues are great. Um, but yeah, I had some managers, but you know what? You need somebody to throw you a bone. You need somebody to give you some opportunities, either some accounts to get started. You need somebody to give you some mentorship and guidance and some breaks. And if you don't have that, you're going to be so lost in that big sea of financial institutions. So I did have somebody who helped me along the way. He was a great manager. So I'm very appreciative of that. Um, we also, at one of the financial institutions I worked at, we had an amazing women's group of investment advisors, and we still keep in touch to this day. And they are just some remarkable women that have been helpful and um, inspiring so I was really, really fortunate to have them in my life. And also I built a really nice network and I'm in Toronto, so it's easy to do that. And I met a lot of other people from different companies like CEOs, VPs, CEO, uh, CFOs, people in the finance world, awesome lawyers like yourselves. <laughs> uh, you know, like just a, you. Lot of, a, lot of, a lot of good people that I've, you know, that want to help and want to build things and create things. And it's that creativity that exists in the financial world, just part of that capitalism model that I appreciate. And I love being a capitalist and I call myself a capitalist activist. Yeah. Define capitalist. <laughs> Everything you're saying is really resonating for me. It's I been love quite similar I to love... the big, the big law world. I just sort of stepped out of, I can, I can relate a lot, um, to a lot of what you're saying. So yeah, how would you define yourself? How would you define capitalism, really? Capitalism, I think, As is a creating self-proclaimed capitalist. <laughs> yeah, it's creating something where there's a need, mm -hmm. and you're addressing the need that, of something that people want. So, capitalism has a very good way of cleansing the crap products or crap services that nobody wants anymore. Um, so, I think it's great because it's propelled us to new levels of economic freedom and. It's improved our lifestyle. It's improved. It can improve the environment. You know, it's it's responding to consumer demand and what the consumer actually wants. Um, you have to toxic capitalism, but usually that dies out because then you're offering products that nobody wants anymore. And then you get rebellions, you get lobbyists, you get things happening. So it's always good. Capitalism makes sure that you can do things better. And it's always a constant, you know, race for improvements. So that's what I like. Yeah, I love hearing creativity and capitalism. I've never really put the two together. And I, yeah. I yeah, well, ar agree. Ar arguably, you could say that the 2008 financial crash happened because capitalism was so, like the financial system had gotten so corrupt, right? Like people were, were selling these derivative products that there was no need for and that nobody even understood. Yeah. So that would be, I suppose, a sort of like fusion of capitalism. Toxic yeah. capitalism. Yeah, that's a good example of that. Um, you know, but you look at it because of that, a lot of people were able to afford houses. So that's why they the demand was such. People were all for it because people were buying homes and it was generating money in the mm -hmm. economy. Not, Of course, yeah. it's going to implode on itself because if you have corruption, that just destroys so many things. Um, corruption is like, it's not so much capitalism. I think people have to look at corruption and corruption is what mm. destroys everything. Well, okay. let's uh, all stay sane. Um, this was a very good venting session. Yeah. And Jen, thank you for assuaging our, our terror fears. Oh, no <laughs> problem. Yeah, Jen, thank you so much for your expertise. Very, there's going to be a lot of good that comes out of this as long as we can all stay mm. healthy. So, okay, well, let's sign off. Love and Thank dividends, you. everyone. Stay Love healthy. Love and dividends.